Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this wonderful workshop session at the Horror Programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes. I'm head of the Horror Programme, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. So we're going to be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university, which was founded in 2017 and birthed in in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're non-profit, we're a registered charity. If you would like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. On this website, you can also find other really exciting programming times and events and awesome lectures like this one that we're going to have now um, and you can also watch them on YouTube and on the Instagram as well. So I'm super excited. I'm a big fan of Oren Katz who we've got here today. He's an artist, researcher and curator who's pioneering work with the Tissue Culture and Art Project which he established in, two, um, sorry, 1996, uh, is considered one of the leading biological art projects. Uh, in 2000, he co-founded Symbiotica, which is an artistic research center, which is housed within the School of Anatomy, Physiology and Human Biology at the University of Western Australia. So under Katz's leadership, uh, Symbiotica has gone to win the pre Ars Electronica Golden Nika in hybrid art in 2007, uh, the WA Premier Science Award in 2008, and became a center for excellence in, two, in 2008 as well. So in 2009, Katz was recognized by Tens and Hudson's 60 Innovators Shaping Our Creative Future book in the category Beyond Design, and by Icon Magazine UK as one of the top 20 designers making the future and transforming the way we work. So uh, Katz uh, has this amazing interest in life, more specifically shaping relations and perceptions of life. Uh, in light of new knowledge and its applications, often working in collabora collaboration with other artists, particularly Dr. Ayan Atzer and scientists. So Katz has developed a body of work that speaks volumes about the need for new cultural articulation of evolving concepts of life. So Katz was a research fellow in Harvard Medical School, a visiting scholar at the Department of, and Art History of Stanford University, and a visiting professor of design interactions at the Royal College of Art London. Katz's ideas and projects reach beyond the confines of art, and his work is often cited as inspiration to diverse areas such as new materials, textiles, design, architecture, ethics, fashion, and food. And I think the list actually goes on and on and on. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to hand over to Oren. So thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to hear what you're up to now. Thanks, Oren. Yeah, thank you so much, Aggie. And uh, it's so great to be with you. And I always kind of admired the University of the Underground from afar. So it's really nice to be part of it. So thanks for this opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm going to, <laughs> speaking about horror, yeah, there, there's some horror and some uh, unanticipated horror, I think, in my talk uh, that uh, we'll unpack as we go through. What I have to tell you, um, very happy for you to jump in as well. It's a small group, so I really enjoy the conversations. And obviously, I would love to have a conversation at the end of my talk. So let's uh, share screens. Just one second. It's always in it. Yep. Is that coming up? Can you see it? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so I titled the talk uh, Pros Promethean Art, and uh, this is kind of already the first step to, towards the horror because obviously um, one of the greatest inspiration uh, that I had was uh, Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And as my talk would progress, you might see some of those connections. And maybe then also in the q and I can tell you a little bit of uh, some of the other Frankensteinian projects that I've been working on. Uh, but I would really like to start by acknowledging the fact that I'm talking to you from the land of the Nunga Wajak people. The, those are the traditional owners of the land from which I'm talking. And I wish to acknowledge the strength and their continuing culture uh, and offer my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And in the background, you can see uh, some of the horrors that we are facing here in Western Australia, and that's kind of the, the risk of bushfires, uh, which actually there is one just now happening uh, about three hours away from us. 
And the, the burning of the land of the Nonga people is something that uh, is obviously of much concern. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. As I promised, I'll be talking to you a little bit about post-Promethean art and what that means to me. So within the ancient Greek culture, they had an issue with the idea of hope. Uh, they saw hope as an obstacle um, to realistic foresight. And actually the translation of uh, Prometheus in ancient Greek is foresight. So it's kind of interesting to see how the connection between the, uh, the Titan Prometheus, who uh, according to Greek mythology stole the fire from the gods and gave it to humans in a sense, uh, stands for the discovery of uh, technology, um, is also the idea of foresight. Yeah. And, and foresight is not necessarily comfortable and good, but within uh, ancient Greek culture, and this is something that I think we need to adopt, is moving away from the blind hope towards a more realistic understanding of what we are facing. But interesting enough, also the, the idea of uh, Prometheanism uh, is something that has been coined uh, in the last 20 years within environmental thought as a, basically as the, the notion of uh, techno-utopianism or techno-optimism. The idea that uh, Earth is a resource for human needs and wants where human innovation and technology would solve the environmental problems. Yeah, so uh, the idea of Prometheanism is something that we see a lot, especially in the design world at the moment, this notion of somehow divorcing ourselves from nature uh, in order to be able to come up with a sustainable uh, means of survival. And, and I'll talk more about it uh, as this talk progresses. So the, the framing of Prometheus is, is kind of threefold. There's obviously the reference to uh, Prometheus the Titan and uh, the modern Prometheus of uh, Mary Shelley, the reference to the idea of foresight, but also the idea of uh, uh, Prometheanism that is being hijacked by the techno-utopianism uh, movement. Um, and I would kind of engage with all of them in some way or another. Um, so Yonat and myself have been working for many, many years, as you heard, with uh, the idea of using living tissue as a medium for artistic expression. And throughout our approach uh, or throughout our practice, we, we we witnessed a lot of uh, what we refer to as neo-lifeism. And that's the idea of the fetishization of technological approaches to life. And in many cases, neo-lifeism and this idea of fetishization of uh, those technological approaches to life uh, overshadows the context in which life operates. Um, it seems that the biological milieu is transferred, transformed into an abstract technological instrument of control where life is just another raw material to be engineered. And this is really Kind of the issues around Prometheanism. Um, decontextualized life has been reconfigured, mixed and remixed, reappropriated and instrumentalized to such an extent that the technologically imagined potential of life often stands for life itself. And, um, and this idea of the technological potential of life is not new. So as early as the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, people like uh, Jack Laug, this uh, guy over here, if, um, uh, who worked from Monterey in California, already started to think about the notion of biology transforming into an engineering pursuit rather than a merely analytical discipline, or as he put it, from a descriptive discipline to a prescriptive discipline. Yeah, so, which is really the, the difference between engineering and science, uh, where he was basically saying that we are learning more and more about how biological processes operate, and therefore we already can start to harness those as an, with an engineering mindset in order to engineer life around us for human ends. And again, Prometheanism. And that kind of links to what we refer to as the psychopathologies of control. So we live in a really interesting time. It's basically a perfect storm where on the one hand, technology becomes more lifelike. So we already are willing to acknowledge the fact that human made technology that was designed from the bottom up is so complex that it's operating almost like a life force by itself. Um, we already relinquishing our control over technological systems. You know, we design systems now to operate outside of human control. So think about, um, you know, all of the algorithms that are driving our social interactions. Think about autonomous cars. Think about our economy or any other large scale hyper object, if you like, like uh, Tim Morton refers to it, that is done by humans, but it's so 
overwhelming that we already acknowledge the fact that uh, humans have no control over. At the very same time, we're trying to assert our control over systems that operated outside of human influence um, for most of the history of life on Earth, and this is life itself. Yeah, so we, through things like synthetic biology and uh, all of the other forms of uh, control of biological systems, we try to figure out ways in which we can control those uh, living things and treat them like instruments for our needs. Now, I would also qualify it, and this is maybe when one of the horrors of our existence uh, 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 should be acknowledged, is that I would argue that any attempt to assert one's control over an autonomous system or a system that operated outside of our influence is by definition an act of violence. Yeah, so any attempt to engineer life is an act of violence and the discussion should really be more around the degree of violence that we're willing to exercise um, against other systems rather than the uh, righteous notion that we somehow can work with life in a collaborative way. It's never the case. It's always an uneven relationship where we are trying to assert our control as humans for our own needs over other systems and by definition engage in a violent relationship uh, with them. Um, I'm currently doing a, an Australian Research Council project with Yonat and two other collaborators, uh, Elizabeth Stevens and Sarah Collins, around the cultural and intellectual history of automated labor. So the next few slides are to do with kind of the interest that Yonat and myself have in this area. And, and one of the really interesting things when you think about automated labor is that it's obviously very much linked to the Industrial Revolution. And one of the main outcomes of the Industrial Revolution was the, um, the transfer of labor from sentient beings, be it slaves, workers, and farm animals, into non-sentient machines. And what we see now with the so-called Fourth Industrial Revolution is the promise that to bring sentiency to machine, yeah, so this idea of artificial intelligence and artificial life, and, and actually machines that are actually respond and are sentient to a large extent uh, to the environment around them, at the very same time that we are trying to remove sentiency from biological systems and biological entities through synthetic biology and um, uh, what's called cellular agriculture, which is basically where most of this exercise in removal of sentiency takes place, uh, where you try to grow animal products without the animals. So it's really about transforming the biological labor into a non-sentient labor. Um, and, and that raises a lot of issues. So obviously the same way that the Industrial Revolution really changed the way humans thought about the place in the world, the way humans interacted with each other and with the world around them, we are now facing another transformation, which is not so much to do with the ability of the technology to do things, but it's more of the mindset that drives us to do it. And, and that would lead us to reassess our relationship to things like the human and non-human, um, the idea of sentiency itself, what is life, what is labor, and what levels of explo exploitations um, would result from this newfound relationship with biological labor. Um, the idea of uh, engineering and uh, maintaining life within a technological, the technological milieu is something that has been gone for a while. Obviously think about domestication, uh, but in the last 150 years, obviously it, it gained quite a lot of speed. And a lot of it is through the work of uh, this guy over here, Alexis Carell, who is credited as the guy who really pushed the whole field of uh, tissue culture, the realization that you can maintain parts of complex living organisms outside of the original body from which they were taken using technological means. Yeah, so using um, different types of environments where those fragments of complex bodies can be maintained alive for varying degrees of uh, duration. And one of his uh, colleagues um, really hit the nail on its head in 1916, where he wrote that uh, through the discovery of tissue culture, they have, so to speak, uh, created a new type of body, this techno-scientific body, this technological body that stands as a surrogate body um, to replace the body from which those cells have been taken. And, and which is kind of important also to note that what he continued to say is this a new form of cell environment, this new body, uh, in many respects is different from the normal body that nature has given to cell to which in which to develop. So this is also a way to think about 
all of those promises of things like cellular agriculture that promise some kind of a new natural environment uh, and a new uh, environmental solution to problems associated with current modes of uh, exploitation and production of animal products. And they talk about it in terms, they're, they're trying to normalize it as if it's natural, uh, but as it was recognized even as back as 1916, those deposit, placing cells from complex organisms inside those new surrogate technological bodies is nothing but natural. Um, and there's obviously raising a lot of issues in regard to what, where, where are we going to put those new entities that are partly uh, uh, alive and partly uh, constructed and maintained within those environmental, uh, those um, artificial environments. Um, and I really like this example. This is uh, the first premature baby, baby ward in the United States. So premise in incubators, and you can see those crowd control rails uh, there, and the reason for that is that it was actually part of a freak show. So the original um, ward was in the Pan American Expo in Buffalo in 1901, but the whole operation moved to Coney Island as one of the very first um, permanent installations in Coney Island as part of the freak show. And there's many reasons why those babies in incubators ended up in a freak show and not in a hospital, uh, but uh, I would just would like to focus on the fact that there was no place to put those entities. They could only be freaks because they only existed as this new form of non-articulated um, living being that until they found a place could only operate under the realm of, of being freaks. And you can see that even when hospitals started to adopt this idea of um, having babies in incubators, those incubators had about 80% success rate as opposed to almost zero if those babies would be left alone. Uh, it was still uh, distributed from Dreamland Coney, Coney Island to hospitals and amusement parks. And in a sense, we're going through the same process of um, developing new freaks um, within the biological realm that still don't have a cultural place to be positioned. And that's really a very fertile ground for artists to engage with trying to create some form of uh, a sense and meaning of the, the existence of those new life forms. Uh, and obviously when we speak about biological freaks, we can't not talk about the Mars with Human spec, which was in a sense, a very strong inspiration for me. Um, when I started with UNAT working with living tissue as a medium for artistic expression. And the reason for that was that for us, it was like the surrealist dream comes alive. This is work of scientists, not of artists. Uh, but it was very much bringing into life um, human fantasy that almost all human cultures um, share, and that's the idea of the chimera, and especially the human-animal hybrid. Um, so here we have a recognizably a human organ, the ear, uh, placed on the back of the mouse. Interestingly enough, this poster kid of tissue engineering um, didn't include any human cells. It was actually bovine cells, so cow cells grow onto a shape of a human ear uh, inserted uh, under the skin or on the back of this um, immune, immunocompromised mouse. Um, and, and what I actually, in 2015, I curated the show that commemorated the 20th anniversary of the first public appearance of that uh, image and went and collected some oral histories and interviewed the scientists that were involved with uh, this uh, particular mouse. And um, it was featured in 95 in a BBC documentary around teacher engineering. And the interesting thing is that three out of the four collaborators decided not to show that because they knew it's going to be problematic uh, for the public, even though they spe specifically chose to grow the shape of the ear rather than any other human organ on the back of the mouse as a way to attract uh, funders and especially the American military. Uh, in the conversations with me, they said that if they would put something like a knee, no one would uh, recognize it or acknowledge it, and they need an image and, and actually an object that would have an impact that would allow them to, um, to attract some fundings, but they didn't want the public to see it, and only one out of the four decided to show it to the journalist, and that became the poster kid uh, for the show and became the poster kid of tissue engineering. And what we see here is also something which became a, a very strong trope in this field, and that's 
the idea of the Petri dish as a stage in which this theater of cruelty and theater of manipulation of life uh, takes place. Obviously, mice don't live in Petri dishes, uh, but that's how uh, that uh, image was presented to the public. Um, so the guy that uh, ended up showing it to the journalists, uh, he claims that he didn't realize what impact it's going to have. And uh, he basically said, ah, oh, yeah, you know, there was an overseas film crew of some TV channel called the BBC. I never heard about them before, so I wasn't really concerned. Uh, but obviously once it hit the media, uh, it became a circus. And he did something which is really curious. He decided to cut the ear from this specific mouse because there are quite a few um, that they were working on. Uh, but this hero image um, was something that he realized has a, a cultural significance way more than a, a scientific significance. And he did something which I think was a mistake. He cut the ear from the back of this mouse and uh, cast it in resin as a museum ready cultural artifact. He was trying to get it to the Smithsonian. I think they've done a great mistake by not accepting it. So it's still waiting in his um, office for a museum to collect it. He initially wanted to gift it. Now we're thinking he wants something like $2 million for it. He did another thing which was really curious as well. He, and that was quite a few years later in 2003, he decided to copyright any image in any media of a mouse with a human ear on its back. He tried to assert full control over the human imagination of this type of chimera. Obviously, uh, I was consulting with um, lawyers. This kind of copyright doesn't hold any water, but it's interesting that as a scientist, he decided that he needs to copyright uh, the image, both in the form of a photograph, even though other scientists have been doing a lot of work with uh, ears on mice since, uh, but he claims that he's got full control over any depiction of that ear on the back of the mouse uh, in form of a photograph, a drawing and a painting and a sculpture. Um, Interesting enough, the, the, the person who actually did the mouse on the urine's back, so, so the guy I was talking about, his name was Charles Vacanti, um, but the person who actually sculpted the ear uh, uh, out of a specific uh, degradable polymer and it did the surgery itself was a Chinese plastic surgeon called Yilin Chow. And Yilin Chow, after he spent his time in Boston, went back to China, got something like $350 million to set up his own Institute of Tissue Engineering and then was commissioned by the Shanghai Museum of Science and Technology that just opened around the beginning of the 2000s um, to make an ear on the back of the mouse specifically for the museum. According to the stories that mouse was alive for the first two weeks of the, uh, after the opening of the museum. So it was there alive in the opening and then lasted for about two weeks. Then they killed it and plastinized it and it's still in the, Shanghai Museum of Science and Technology as, as a, again, as a cultural object that was done specifically for cultural reasons. Yeah, so that wasn't even done as a scientific or, or under the guise of a scientific experiment. It was done specifically as a museum object um, and then was plastinized and still sitting there um, as, as a sculpture in a sense made by this plastic surgeon. Um, something which might be a bit closer to home for some of you is Dolly the Sheep. So Dolly the Sheep was a really interesting uh, object in a sense, because um, that was the first uh, uh, cloned mammal, but it looked like any other farm animal. So there was nothing uh, special about the appearance of uh, Dolly, but it was still obviously an important, a very important um, technological breakthrough and a very important important kind of cultural uh, artifact. So after Dolly died, um, she was stuffed and was gifted to the Edinburgh, or the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And that created quite a problem within the museum because obviously it was a natural history specimen. It was treated as such, but it belonged to the science and technology part of the museum. And I really like this image because this is the image of Dolly moving from the natural history section of the museum to where it is now. And that's uh, in the cultural, uh, sorry, in the science and technology section of the National Museum of Scotland. Um, but many other museums wanted a piece of Dolly. And I was really surprised I was in the um, Science Museum in London quite a few years back, and I came across this. Um, it was actually the Wellcome Trust decided to collect some of Dolly's droppings. Yeah, so speaking about the fetishization of uh, uh, 
the culture, the technological approaches to life, this is kind of the ultimate, you can go and worship Dolly's droppings uh, in the Science Museum in London, but obviously no museum ever collected any of the 277 failed attempts uh, to create a cloned um, animal before uh, the successful um, manifestation of Dolly. So that's kind of a bit of background. Um, let me talk a little bit about kind of my background and, and what led me to do what I'm doing now. And in the mid nineties, I was studying design. I actually studied product design with a very strong environmental uh, slant to it. I was really trying to save the world at the time. And um, I got more and more interested in the idea of designing with living biological materials. So they, talking about 96, so that was very early in the game. Uh, where I was imagining in a very naive way that if we are to design with living biological materials, we might solve quite a lot of the problems associated with the current modes of uh, production and consumption. Uh, so if we shift our, our culture from a culture of uh, building and manufacturing to a culture of growing, we somehow will be able to create a more sustainable uh, made environment. So that's what I thought at the time. Um, and also would create a more caring environment in the sense that we would care for our, uh, our products in the same way that we would care for the plants in the garden, for example. It's not something that will move away from a throwaway society to a society of caring and, and, and maintenance of the living products that we will all um, engage with. Uh, but very early, I already realized that there's a flip, flip side to that. If we start to treat life as a raw material, is we start to design with life, if we start to treat living things as if they are products, our relationship to the idea of life might, might also shift and change. So as I was doing my research in 1996, I sent a letter to uh, anyone I could think about to, to get their opinion about it. And as you can see, if you see at the top of the screen, um, I already refer to myself as a biodesigner, I refer, or, and, um, I was already started to ask questions and be concerned about the ethical implications of what it means to design with living biological um, objects in such a way. Uh, I got very little in, in terms of responses. People were kind of shocked and no one really engaged with that conversation as much as I would love them to do. But it kind of gave me a push forward. Um, and then I was lucky enough to so my design project was very much what can be considered to be now a speculative design. I was speculating a future in which designers would be called upon to design living biological products, acknowledging the fact that biology became an engineering pursuit and the engineers would start to engineer living biological systems and the designers would be called to work with them to design those products. Um, and I was looking at many different approaches. So in my thesis itself, I was looking at things like biofilms, uh, which now we see a lot around kind of this idea of kombucha, cellulose and all of those kind of things. I was looking at genetically engineered plants that would be able to uh, be engineered to produce different objects and shapes. Uh, but the technology that really caught me and that was a lot to do with the fact that the mouse with the back appeared is uh, the technology of tissue engineering because that generated for me one of the largest kind of conceptual shifts that I felt we are going through in the 90s and that's the shift towards the notion of the body as its own technology. So this slide over here is from a, a presentation that one of the pioneers in tissue engineering, Joseph Facanti, the brother of the guy that uh, was presenting the mouse with urine spec, uh, presented in the third international tissue engineering meeting, funny enough, in, in Disney World in Orlando, um, where he was very proud to show how in short 10 years, the idea of the body and repairing the body really changed and shifted due to this idea of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. So uh, the blue image on your left, you can see, is from uh, Life magazine from 1989. And what you see there is how they imagined the body would be repaired uh, using the dry, hard, mechanical, electrical engineering devices to bit by bit replace foily, failing or missing body parts. Yeah, so what, what can be uh, thought about in terms of the, the tin man solution. Um, and the other image on your right is from exactly 10 years later, and that's this idea of uh, basically, as I said, treating the body as its own technology of repair, uh, somehow figuring out ways to harness those latent regenerative 
uh, abilities of the body in order to grow the body's spare parts using the biology of the body itself. Yeah, and, and this is really what tissue engineering is all about. Um, in the 90s, the promise was, and this is also quite interesting to watch that 1995 documentary, um, where they basically, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's always the 10 years horizon where it's going to hit the market. Yeah. So 1995, they were promising in, in 10 years time, we'll have organs waiting for us on shelves uh, for us to uh, replace our failing or missing uh, organs. Uh, one of the propositions was that uh, we'd be able to um, grow a heart in the lab. So in 1995, scientists gave themselves a deadline of 10 years to do so. You know, we are way past the deadline. We're not even close to achieving it, but the mindset was there. Yeah. So the mindset of the body as a technology to repair uh, was already there. So my logic and together with Jonat was, uh, how about reversing the logic? How about if in the 80s, we're told we can replace the heart with the pump, in the 90s, we're told we can grow hearts. Our question was, why not just grow pumps? Yeah. Um, so this idea of uh, using the technology of tissue engineering um, <clears throat> as a way to uh, grow products that are functional in one way or another, but without ever intending to reintroduce them into the body. So what you see here, again, it's a, it's a very old slide from the early days of tissue engineering. The idea then was that you somehow uh, create a three-dimensional scaffold out of uh, degradable polymers that are um, non-toxic and can break down into um, things like water and CO2. Um, you design those scaffolds in the shape of the organ you're trying to replace. Uh, you see them with the cells of the organ you're trying to replace. So as the stem cell research progressed with stem cells that would then uh, differentiate into those cells, uh, you grow them in vitro outside of the body using techniques that were developed by Carell in the early uh, 19th, 20th century, and you then uh, implant them into the body and you have a new organ, and the idea is obviously use the patient on cells and there's no rejection and, and so forth. Uh, this is not as easy, it's still not the case. Uh, there's many, many other obstacles in regard to that. Um, but we were saying, okay, so now we can create what we started to talk about in terms of this semi-living entities. So objects that are partly constructed and partly grown, uh, products that are uh, made out of parts of uh, complex organisms, but uh, are still functioning, but existing outside of the body from which those original cells have been taken. And within kind of the non-medical application areas, we already started to list kind of where it might go. So we are looking at the idea of using tissue engineering as research models, as sensors, as actuators, food and leather, which is what we see now with cellular agriculture and art. And we decided to continue our investigation as an art project because we became so much more interested in the questions that this proposition raises rather than the potential solutions that uh, might come out of this. Um, and decided to continue our research, problematizing it rather than uh, becoming solutionist because we noticed the immense issues that just thinking about the potential of, of growing those semi-living uh, might raise. Um, so in 1996, we set up the Tissue Culture and Art Project. We were really lucky that we gained access to labs. So we were able to speak to scientists at the University of Western Australia to be able to learn the techniques of tissue culture and develop our own kind of understanding of tissue engineering. And then in 2000, we were able to go and spend a year in Harvard Medical School um, working as research fellows in one of the top tissue engineering uh, labs at the time uh, with some of the pioneers of the field. And then when we came back from Boston, we set up Symbiotica, which became a research lab because one of the things we realized is that many other artists were started to get interested and couldn't figure out how they can gain access to those very strict and, and, and precious resources that we somehow were able to negotiate access to. And we were very lucky to be able to get some funding to build a dedicated space for artistic research into the life sciences. We expanded our interest beyond just teaching engineering. And we decided Symbiotica would be an artistic research that deals with questions of life from the molecular to the ecological, but with a strong emphasis on hands-on experiential lab work, because this is the model that we developed with the Tissue Culture and Art Project. We decided from the very beginning, not just to look over the scientists' shoulders, not just to trust what the scientists are telling us, but actually experience it ourselves by us working 
in the lab and developing our own projects uh, with sometimes guidance, guidance and mentorship by scientists, but for us to, to do the work ourselves. And this became the, the ethos and the model of Symbiotica. Uh, and shortly after we got funding to build our dedicated space, and we also were able to gain our own level two biological lab. So it was, as far as we know, the first biological lab that was dedicated for artistic and design research into the life sciences. And we're still running, but as I told Eggy, uh, there's a great potential the university is going to shut us down sometime this year. So, you know, we had a, long, a good run of 22 years, but hopefully we'll be able to run for a bit longer. Uh, so as I said, yeah, we see ourselves as an artistic laboratory dedicated to the artistic research, learning, critique, and hands-on engagement with life sciences. Uh, we try to articulate um, the culture, the new cultural language uh, to the shifting relations and perceptions of life using art. Um, all right, I'll, because I realized I'm talking too much, I, I might skip what Symbiotica is doing. You can check what we do on our website, uh, but we run everything from academic programs. Um, Lindsay is one prime example of uh, our graduates of our Masters of Biological Arts, uh, we run exhibitions, uh, conferences, symposium, symposia, and um, we, the main thing we do is really running our residency program where we invite artists and researchers that don't usually have access to the lab um, to spend a minimum of three months um, engaging in a very hands-on experiential um, process of learning more about life and ways of manipulating it. All right, so I'll skip that, workshops, different areas. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the pseudo utilitarian projects uh, that United and myself have been running uh, because it's becoming really relevant now. So one of the very first projects that we've done when we arrived to the tissue engineering lab in Harvard was to grow a piece of meat. Um, when you think about uh, exploring the relationship to the idea of life, meat and food comes very uh, close uh, because one cannot have a more intimate relationship with another life form than incorporating it into one's own body. Yeah? So eating another living being is what we do on a daily basis, but it's the most intimate relationship that we can have with another life form. Um, so uh, it made sense for us, not so much because we're trying to feed the world or reduce animal suffering or reduce environmental impact of uh, uh, meat production. It was really, the, the main motivation was really about the idea of exploring our relationship to life and what it means to consume meat that never existed in a body that drove us to grow our first piece of meat. And here you can see it. And um, the first piece of meat was grown in the lab, so we were not allowed to eat it. But then in 2003, uh, we were lucky enough to uh, be invited to an exhibition in France called La Art Biotech. And we had enough uh, uh, funding and the gallery was brave enough to allow us to set up a fully functioning um, tissue engineering lab in the gallery itself. And we were able to use it in order to grow a small piece of meat that we then consumed at the very last day of the exhibition. Now, because the exhibition was in France, we also played on the idea of what constitutes foul food. We knew that uh, French people don't like the idea of engineered food very much. And we knew that most other cultures don't like the idea of eating frogs very much. So we decided to tissue engineer uh, frog meat. Uh, so here you can see the design of the lab that had a direct relationship to both the architecture of the space uh, of the gallery, as well as a reference to Alexis Carell's original tissue engineer, tissue culture lab in the Rockefeller Institute in New York. Uh, but uh, you can also see that we had the dining room as part of the lab and a fish tank that had um, the frogs that we rescued from the edible frog distributor in town. And this video kind of is, uh, I'm not going to show the whole of it, but as far as we know, um, this is at least the first documented uh, instance where someone put into the mouth a piece of meat that was grown in the lab rather than in the body of the animal. We were able to grow about five grams of that meat. We shared it among six people in this ultimate Nouveau Cuisine dinner at the last day of the exhibition. And totally see Joe Davis uh, trying to cut the meat and putting, him, putting it in his mouth. Now, as you can see, I found it really hard to eat, uh, to cut. The, the problem was that uh, the growth period was limited by the uh, duration of the exhibition itself. So the polymer structure on which those cells were growing 
didn't degrade completely, so it had somewhat of a, a fabric of felt like uh, texture. And you can see I'm trying to chew it. And the muscle cells that we are growing, uh, we didn't exercise them, so the uh, somewhat of a consistency of uh, jello. So it was basically like trying to eat uh, jello on fabric. The sauce was really good. I instructed the chef to grow, to cook the meat in a garlic and honey sauce, which are well-known antibacterial agents as a way of dealing with potential contamination. Um, and to our delight, three out of the six people that joined us for that uh, dinner couldn't swallow it, so they spat it out, uh, which meant that we could then uh, be collect those bits that were spat out by the participants and showed uh, those bits in the follow-up exhibition, the remains of disembodied cuisine, which had this like three screen video um, installation, as well as the bits that were spat out. Um, then in 2012, a Dutch scientist had a press conference in Toronto where he said, I'm going to be the first person to grow burger, uh, a Lebron burger, and I'm going to get a chef to cook it for me and I'm going to uh, present it to celebrities. And I was lucky enough to be invited to the Dutch Electronic Arts Festival in Rotterdam that year, and they invited me to run an evening uh, where I had a budget to, to basically run an event. And I decided to run a cooking show or a cook-off uh, where I invited that scientist to cook against a philosopher to discuss the future of Lebron meat and uh, the future of protein consumption. So that was before he unveiled his burger. And the secret ingredient in this cook-off was fetal calf serum, which is one of the ingredients that you use when you grow cells in the lab. Now, some of the companies are growing meat in the lab claiming that they found something else, but at the time that was the standard, there was no real way around it. So this um, blood from an unborn, or the blood plasma from an unborn cow is one of the ingredients in growing this so-called victimless meat, yeah? so. It's not that victimless in any way or form. And that was part of the thing that we were trying to highlight with our series of our pseudo totalitarian works, where we were talking about the way in which Western technology is getting better and better in obscuring and hiding the victims of our consumption rather than eliminating them. And we wanted to highlight that through this cooking show. We, to the credit of the scientist Mark Post, he was game. So here he is on, yeah, you're right. Um, I hooked him up with a, a really interesting artist called uh, Zach Dunfield, who is part of the duo of, that are running the um, Center, for uh, Center for Genomic Astronomy. Um, and they were the, in the kind of the four uh, corner of the, the room. And in the against, uh, we had Monica Becker, who was a really interesting Polish philosopher, who was talking a lot about um, the idea of the agency of the others. And um, I hooked her up with John O'Shea, who is a very interesting artist. He spent actually quite a lot of time being the artistic director of the Science Gallery in London. Um, and he, he was very much involved in different kind of um, interventions around meat consumption, so it kind of made sense. And <clears throat> they basically both cooked against each other and talked about kind of the future of protein. This format became quite a successful format. I've been running those kind of cooking performances um, around Europe uh, for quite some time. I haven't done one for a while, obviously I can't leave Australia, uh, but um, this format became a really interesting kind of venue for conversation and uh, debate around the future of food. Uh, and then a year after we, hit, we did this thing with the Dutch scientist with Mark Post, he unveiled his burger as a performative act. And again, as a cultural event rather than a scientific event, he got a, a news reporter from ITV News in the UK we got a celebrity chef to cook the burger. There was no verification. There was no peer review associated with um, this particular tasting. And uh, it was beamed all over the world as, as one of the biggest kind of news events of 2013 that really became the watershed event that pushed this whole field of cellular agriculture and propelled it forward and uh, uh, raised crazy amount of um, venture capital investment in those companies that are popping up like mushrooms now. Um, actually, I don't have it here, but he, he also, the interesting thing is that he only gave that uh, burger to the two tasters there. The journalist in the room were begging for him to give them a taste and he refused. He said, it's going to be for my kids. But what he actually did was to plastinate 
um, that burger and to donate it to the Dutch Museum of Science and Technology, again, as a cultural artifact. Um, in 2004, we followed up the uh, Lebron Meat project with our victimless leather project, where we grew a piece of leather. Um, that ended up being shown as part of the Design Elastic Mind exhibition in MoMA in 2008. And out of the 250 uh, exhibits in MoMA, that was trying, the show was uh, somewhat of an optimistic show that was trying to show that if you get artists and designers to work with science and technologies, they're going to solve the, pro the problems of the world. Uh, we were quite surprised when we were invited because we're not really solutionists, but obviously you don't say no when MoMA invites you. And we decided to obviously to show a living version of a victimless letter project. And a few weeks into the show, um, the cells that we were using sheared off the polymer structure, clogged the system, a sleeve of the jacket. So we grew those tiny jackets uh, using mouse cells. Uh, the sleeve of the jacket fell off and we made the decision together with Paolo Antonelli to turn the life support off. And lots of respect to Paolo Antonelli, the curator of design in MoMA, who decided to go out, out and, and, and talk about it. Um, and talking about kind of the, the strange relationship that she formed with the jacket, talking about issues around the fact that she said that she's pro-choice, but she, should see, she still felt really bad turning off the life support from this tiny jacket that was grown out of mouse cells. And as you can imagine, the media had the field day, yeah. Art Asia Pacific titled the article Matter in MoMA, New York Times uh, talked about it in terms of MoMA kills art. And it became obviously a bit of a sensation, but also, it generated a really interesting discussion around the responsibility that one has to exercise in regard to in manipulated living uh, systems that uh, you try to design and, and use for your own ends, uh, rather than this uh, blanket optimism that somehow we're going to solve the problems of the world. Um, so as an art project and as an art intervention within the design world, I think it worked really well. Uh, many of the designers thought it was a failed project and good for them for thinking that, but obviously as uh, someone who self-identifies an artist, I didn't really bother too much about it, but uh, it, it did actually had the desired impact from our perspective, because in most cases, our work generates uh, more often than not the undesirable impact, and this is one example of that. So in 2018, I was invited to give a lecture in the Biofabricate meeting in New York. Biofabricate is uh, an annual meeting that uh, started by Suzanne Lee, a designer from the UK that um, uh, he, her claim to fame is that she was the first creative director in an executive of a biotech company called Modern Meadow. And she's very much into trying to find ways to grow product rather than manufacturing them. And the Biofabricate meeting is a meeting that uh, she um, organizes where she basically tried to hook up all of those startup companies with potential investors um, in order to really progress this field of uh, biofabrication and cellular agriculture. And in that particular year, in 2018, they decided to make a timeline of that uh, field. And they decided that the starting point would be our 2004 Victimless Letter project. And um, so, so this put me in somewhat of an existential crisis because here's an example of, you know, I, I was humbled by the fact that uh, someone thought that um, somehow our work generated such impact that it can be considered to be uh, the trigger for a birth of a new field. But then on the other end, they totally didn't get it. Um, because it, it, like in many cases, this is a case where a cautionary tale becomes an instructional manual for the neoliberal uh, innovation paradigm, uh, which is very much the case with the victimless letter here. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I understand, yeah, we're actually running out of time. So I, I might stop here. This is uh, Isha Datar. She's the CEO of a nonprofit company that promotes um, this whole field of cellular agriculture. She actually claims that she coined the term cellular agriculture. And she recently gave a TED talk where I was able to capture this really beautiful moment where she talks about uh, the point that I made at the beginning that the aim of um, cellular agriculture is about removing sentiency because that's considered to be some kind of a, of a surplus wasteful thing like the pigs and the feather that we don't need to grow in order to grow a chicken breast. Yeah? So why do we need you know, things like pigs, feathers and sentiency when we want to consume only the meat 
of those organisms. So I'll leave it here. I have so many more slides that uh, I might leave my presentation on. So when you ask me questions, I might be able to address it as, uh, as the issues come along. So thank you so much for your attention and let's have a chat. Thank you. Fabulous, Oren, thank you so much. Um, I, like usual, have a large number of questions, but I'm, I'm sure the students have many as well. So is it, has anyone got any questions for Oren? I can't see all of you, so if you can just jump in and talk. So. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, thank you. This was incredibly interesting. Uh, since we, like with this final slide, we got back to the matter of sentiency. So I'm like, um, but then with Paola Antonelli and the code, it was not really about that. I felt it was more like about growth and uh, this like image of life as like something that is building up on itself. So there's not sentiency involved, but there's, so I was wondering if you could expand a little on that. Like, what do you think that prompted the reaction that much in that case? Because um, like, if we just focus on sentency, so maybe there's like a whole level of beings that are not involved in the, into the discourse. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm wondering how, where you put the limit and how, what's uh, the investigation there? Yeah, it's a great question and it, and it raises so many, kind of opens up so many things. So first of all, I think that, uh, and this is something that uh, United and myself are always trying to address in our work, and that's examples of the acute poverty of our language. And it, and it seems to be across all cultures when it comes to dealing with life. Yeah, so, you know, the, the story goes that the Inuits have like 70 words to deal with snow. In the English language, there's more than 50 words to describe shit. But we have only one word to describe life in all of its manifestations. Yeah. So, so without having the right language to, to deal with the nuance um, and, and the complexity of life, we are basically trying to deal with something that we are currently in the midst of, of, of manipulating this vast thing that we call life or in all of its manifestations using a very, very blunt instrument of a very poor language. Yeah. So, so when sometimes when you talk about life, it can be interchangeable with sentiency. Sometimes, as you pointed out, it's not. Um, we really need to find a new way to articulate our relationship to this huge thing, this meta, or this hyper object that we refer to as life. Um, and, and we really don't have any tools to do it. So what we do as artists, and this is kind of, I feel, the role of artists, is, is to point out um, at areas that we feel needs more cultural scrutiny and needs to develop more meaning and, and, and articulation through language which can be both verbal and visual. And, and so in a sense, I don't really have an answer for you, but I do have an answer in the sense that it's the, there's a really interesting thing around the art world, which on the one hand tries to portray itself as one of the most pro progressive and advanced kind of a, a epistemology and subculture of human existence. And on the other end, it's one of the most conservative and the most constrained ways of human expression yeah so there's some things that artists are not allowed to do and we are facing it on a daily basis that we are basically being told that because we're engaging with life itself as a, both as a material uh, and the subject and the object of our um, artistic interest and manipulation we're, we're not artists anymore yeah because we, we cross some kind of an, an imaginary boundary where artists shouldn't have crossed that line um oh the horror yeah of doing so um but the, something that we need to remember is that as our, as our engineering ability to deal with life is increasing, and if there's anything we learn from our history is that what we choose to do to other life forms, be sentient or non-sentient, we would end up doing to ourselves. Yeah? So, so even, even though our work is always trying to shy away, the only project that we've done that was related in some way or form uh, with the human form was the um, ear project that we've done with Stella, which I, I haven't had time to talk to you about. And that was one of the very first, one of the only times that we were actually accused of uh, blasphemy because we somehow touched the image of God, which is if anyone thinks that Stella is the image of God, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll worship that church, but um, it's, um, 
it's kind of an interesting thing with kind of the, the, the separation, obviously, of the human and the manipulation of human um, from, from others, but we are actually, what, what we're doing with other life forms, it's a, a, basically a practice run to what we might be doing to, to ourselves. So, um, there's kind of this acknowledgement of that. So when you think about sentiency, often people would think that uh, is something that's only reserved to human. The more, the more knowledge we generate actually around the life sciences, the more we realize that sentiency is a gradient and, and a continuum and, and that's actually a uh, bacteria also express some form of sentiency, especially uh, if you consider bacteria as being a community of a hyper organism rather than individual cells. Um, so we need to know more about it. But if we are jumping already to do those irreversible manipulations in, in um, engineering of life forms, we'll never have the opportunity to actually stop and think uh, about what we're doing. And this idea of urgency is a really interesting one. And, and again, I think this is where the power of art lies because we, do, we can never hide behind utility. As much as people are trying to push us, even in our pseudo utilitarian projects, we will never, you know, the, the whole idea is about the futility and the non-utilitarian um, aspects of, of what we're trying to do in order to be, to, to be able to um, articulate and distill the epistemological, ontological and ethical issues that the work generates without ever resorting to hide behind utility, you know, needing to save the world in some way, you know, cure the cancer or feed the world. It's never our intention. And actually I have a policy of every morning almost coming to the lab and basically telling the people in the lab, this is another day where we're not going to save the world. So, you know, just remember that as artists, our role is to problematize and highlight the issues around um, those attempts to save the world, because in most cases, they are not going, they're, they're going to basically result in the opposite. Ab, Lindsay, did you have a question you've written in the chat? Yeah, sorry, I wrote it so I wouldn't forget. Um, there's like this tension between care and the violence that's also inherent in the actions that are being performed by both artists and scientists in interacting with all these emerging entities. Um, I was kind of wondering if you could speak more about how you navigate this in your own practice and also in your yours and your not's practice as well. Yeah, so first of all, I think one needs to acknowledge it. Um, that, and this is something that many Many of the scientists, many of the technologies, many of the designers that are working in this field are not even willing to contemplate the fact that they're engaging in a, in a violent act. So by, by doing so, you first of all try to minimize the violence, but also acknowledge the fact that our existence is littered with corpses in a sense. Yeah, for us to exist, there's different um, degrees of violence that we constantly have to exercise, but also if if any one of you has kids, you know that the relationship with the kid and the caring for the kid and raising a kid is also to a large extent, you know, with all of the love that you have to, to your kid, there's also some violence involved in that, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, physical, but it is about asserting your control over their wills in order for them even to, to grow and, and, you know, not cross the road in front of the car or, or whatever. So there is this acknowledgement that you need the, and, and by that you, 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 in a sense, kind of take the sting out of this kind of self-righteousness that many of the people who are working in the field are currently suffering of um, in order to do so. <clears throat> the, there's really interesting things like uh, within the Japanese culture, and this is something we already experienced when we were in Boston, where we worked with Japanese scientists that were doing a lot of animal experimentation. And, and, and some of the relationship that they had with the animals was extremely um, problematic from our perspective in the way they were treating the animals. But once a year, they had a ceremony where they gave thanks to the animals that they used in research. And now it's expanded, actually, my colleague Hideo Iwasaki, a really interesting Japanese scientist, uh, built a shrine for synthetic life forms. So, so this idea of at least being able to acknowledge the fact that you need to give thanks and you need to acknowledge and to ask forgiveness from the life forms, the forms that you've been um, involved in the either acts of violence or the destruction of is is one step that um, I think is an interesting one to 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 have in regard to at least have it in the back of your mind because again most of the scientists that we've been working with were avoiding it even though I actually I must say that we've been working with quite a few scientists who done animal experimentation but they were vegans 
And this idea of somehow paying back in a different way. So basically saying, yeah, you know, we sacrifice those animals for uh, human advancement of knowledge or for to find kind of um, different uh, therapies. Uh, but in our personal life, we would pay for it in a sense by, um, by becoming vegans. And, and this is kind of a really interesting thing in, in regard to a lot of the conversation around cellular agriculture, because beside kind of the saving uh, the world, um, there's the line that they're constantly talking about, which is so horrifically neoliberal and that's a uh, guilt-free consumption. So this idea of abundance without consequences that is being pushed as, as a way for us to be able to um, feel okay with uh, consum cons consuming the world, yeah? And, and again, the guilt without, or the abundance without consequences, the consumption without guilt are, are all kind of masking the real impact of our existence on the world by creating this um, layers and layers and layers of um, uh, technology, which more often than not is really used as, as a way of hiding uh, and obscuring our victims rather than solving any real problem in the world. Could I maybe ask something just to like a, 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 that might be a follow on from that? Because obviously we're we're dealing with the topic of horror here, and and what I find really interesting about your work is like it's I, it's obviously extremely connected to horror, but you haven't had to even say that it's not <laughs> it's so it's implied. But and what I'm really interested in is like obviously there's body horror, but there's also like cosmic horror, there's doom, there's like a, a, a catastrophe and, and um, particularly things like tragic irony in the work, you know, that, and what I'm, what I found really interesting often about when you're doing these talks is that you involve the audience are like in on the fact that there's, there's gonna be, there's like an impending doom about to occur on the basis of what you're doing. And I know that there's not necessarily like an equation <laughs> to generate that feeling, but is there, I mean, do you sort of, how do you work with that? Is that like iterative? So you talk to the audience and then you think, okay, well, this way of framing the project is more likely to create that sensation or, or is that something that you just build a sensibility to? It's, it's really interesting because actually uh, we, we're currently working on a new project uh, that would open next month, uh, which deals with, um, I don't know if you see the slide where I talk here about uh, the metabolic rift. So this uh, kind of post-Marxist idea of uh, the way in which we separate ourselves from our means of uh, existence. Uh, and, and in a sense, again, this is what those startup companies are doing as an ideal, yeah? This idea of separating ourselves and separating what we grow from nature as a way in the name of sustainability, which is kind of totally ridiculous. Um, and we did decide that with this project, we were actually trying to push exactly what you were talking about, this kind of, uh, uh, this deceit in a sense, but this kind of, uh, uh, to, to a new level from our perspective, we're not setting up a startup company, but we are going to make people, I suppose, assume that we are a startup company. Yeah, so we, we're not, going the whole way to the trope of, you know, a fake company, but we're going to use enough language and enough kind of uh, graphics to, to make it, um, to, to get, to have the sense of that, where we're going to basically act as if we are one of those uh, technologies that believe that the metabolic rift is actually a solution rather than an issue. Um, so, so we're promoting, it's like towards sustainable metabolic rift, we, we are using kind of this type of language around it, um, and, and it is based on, on experience because when I give talks to audience, especially in those startup meets, uh, uh, investor talks where I'm kind of the, the fig leaf of ethical conversation or the will me out as kind of this um, misguided visionary that thought about those things way before the companies were thinking about. And, and I'm trying to be as clear as I can, you know, so I work as an artist. I think art works much better when it's ambiguous rather than kind of trying to hit someone with a hammer on the head. Um, and, and that's why, you know, our work is being misunderstood often. But when I give talks, I'm trying to be as clear and non-ambiguous as I can, but still people come to me in this context and ask to invest in my company. Or I just recently gave a talk in a conference in India, which was kind of uh, 
DIY biology meets kind of real scientist type of thing. And in the end of my talk, uh, the MC said, wow, that was a really interesting talk. It's going to stay with us throughout the whole conference. And we wish you best of luck with your new products and uh, with the launch of your company. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, have you listened to a word I said? So, you know, it's not easy. It, it's actually, it's not difficult to make those deceits even when you're not trying. Yeah. So, um, and, and that's when we introduce the humor. And, and it's also a really interesting cultural phenomena because some cultures just don't get irony. Some cultures just expect everything on, on face value and they don't understand that, you know, when we talk about the victimless leather, it's actually about rise, raising the issues of, of, of the victim, not about the victimless. Um, it's an irony, it, it's an ironic title, um, you know, with the collecting the, the bits that were spit out by the people. This is something that, you know, people wouldn't really be able to understand because they were so set within kind of this um, kind of positivist, solutionist notions that you only can do stuff towards, you know, and this is kind of the line of this of Silicon Valley, yeah, making the world a better place through one more casino, online casino and porn science at the time, yeah. But they still believe that I'm in the ethos of making the world a better place. So, um, so we are playing with it. You know, sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes we, we, we're trying to be dead serious and realize people don't understand us and then, you know, the twist occur. Other times we, we try to really insert the, um, the humor in that, but you know, but even in, with our pig wings project, so we did grow wing shaped objects out of pig tissue as a way of kind of addressing the hyperbole rhetoric around um, uh, biotechnology. And you know, that was 22 years ago where we've done it. And we wrote a small science fiction story where we talked about a farm where pigs are growing wings where they can later be attached to humans. And we got a request from a Japanese film crew to come and see our farm. And we got, um, you know, th that's when we also started to talk about the aesthetics of disappointment because when we grew our wings, they were tiny. Yeah, so the wings were, and they were some of the biggest stitch engineered constructs to be grown at the time. So they're about two centimeters uh, wingspan with like about half a centimeter of thickness. And people would come to the gallery believing that if they're not going to see fine pigs, they would at least see wings that are big enough for pigs to fly with. And then they would see those tiny objects in those cheap jewelry boxes. And that's when we talk, we, we started to talk about the work in, in terms of the aesthetics of disappointment. Yeah, so taking people to, even without us wanting, they're going through this journey of expectation uh, only for that to be dashed by uh, what they're experiencing. And, and it is an interesting one because within our field, and you know, this is a very valid artistic strategy, is there's quite a few artists that are claiming that they've done things that are biologically impossible. Yeah. And, and they have every right to do so as artists because, you know, artists never signed the dotted line that said that they need to uh, tell the truth or make things appear as what they are. So the yeah, artists are celebrated for making things appear as something that they are not. Um, but with our work, we made the decision that we are going to stick to the, you know, almost in a very kind of strict modernist idea that we are honest to the technologies and the materials we're using, and we're not going to lie. But therefore, the results are, are, can, be, can be sometimes extremely underwhelming, and that's okay with us. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Any, any other final questions, perhaps? I mean, that yeah. there's like so. Oh, go, go, go after that. No, no. no, no, go for it. It's uh, it's not really a question. It's uh, yeah, maybe like um, because you're uh, trying to find the bits where it wh which area it's touching, like we saw with uh, Dolly, like it's it's uh, going from the cultural department to the scientific department. And I was wondering if uh, it has to be in a specific area because as you said, you're using also strangeness to um, attract uh, like the audience. And uh, so, yeah, it's like, um, does it have to find a place or it, or because if it find a place, then it fits in something and fitting in something doesn't, like it's not, um, it's losing its, uh, its strangeness or, um, 
I don't know if I'm clear with what I'm saying, but. <laughs> No, it's, it's a great point. And, and there's, again, so many way, different ways one can approach it. So yeah, obviously within the 20th century, there was the idea of uh, art of making strange, yeah, making the everyday look new again by making the making strange, making the everyday strange or any other thing. So the experience of art was always about kind of putting the audience and putting the viewer in a, a position where, where, they f where strangeness where, where is a vehicle for you to see the world in a new way. Um, What's really interesting now is it's actually those startup companies that are making the way the world way stranger than what artists can ever do. You, you know, not just the startup companies. You, you know, you can think about the, the person who made the world the strangest in the last decade is Donald Trump, who's the best performance artist ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you do performance art after Donald Trump? There's no way. You know, he he he, he nailed it. Um, so so what we can do as artists is much more humble attempts to, to confront people by doing so. But the, the other question about place is, is a really interesting one. And Yonati myself wrote a lot about it recently, about this idea of the, the social contract. So if you go into a specific institute by crossing the threshold of the institute, you have a contract with the institute that what you're going to experience is specific to that place. So if you cross the threshold into an art gallery, you know that what you experience is art regardless of what the object is. And if you go into a science museum, you, uh, you have a different contract, you read the work, even if it's the same work, you would read it differently. And this is something we experienced when showing our work. So the victimless letter has been shown in quite a few different contexts. And each time, each institution it was placed in changed the reading of the work completely. Yeah. And, and it's actually something we're really interested in, this idea that actually it doesn't have a place because the place is determined by the contract of the institution that chooses to position it and where to position it. You know, um, so we did a piece in 2018, um, actually, where we were trying to address it, and this is this work over here, um, which was to look at um, the kind of queerness of nature. It was actually it was generated somewhat by the same-sex marriage debate in Australia, where like anywhere else in the world, the conservatives were talking about the fact that um, gay relationship is unnatural. So we went to our local natural history museum and we gave the um, zoology curators a challenge of coming up with life forms in their collection that uh, bring into question our ideas or humans' ideas about things like, um, first of all, what it means to have a body. So what is a body? Um, what is sex, what is gender, what is reproduction? And they come up with amazing ways in which the living world, the natural world came up with. So there are organisms that figure out ways in which they can use homosexuality as, as a very successful um, reproductive strategies. There's other organisms that don't have a self of identity in a sense because they're made out of fragments that can break and exist uh, independently from each other. And um, there's things like the seahorse over here where the male is actually pregnant. Um, there's, I don't know if you see the beer bottle there. It's a story of a, a beer bottle that was very popular in Australia and scientists then started to see that uh, there's a specific type of jewel, jewel beetle that is going extinct. And they realized the reason for that is that the male of the jewel bottle became sexually attracted to the bottle, sorry, the, the jewel beetle was, became sexually attracted to this beer bottle and they would just spend their life trying to have sex with the bottle and not with the females. And this uh, beetle almost became extinct until conservationists asked the, uh, the beer companies to stop producing those types of bottles with the same, with this finish that somehow became really attractive to those beetles. So, but then we, we went another step where we uh, went to a luxury display, uh, retail display designers, and we asked them to design display cabinets that everything you put in the cabinet would look precious. Yeah? Um, and then we put it in an art gallery. So uh, people who came into the art gallery and saw something that looked like a luxury shop that had natural history museum specimens. And that was a little bit of kind of institutional critique because people were extremely confused. Are, are they seeing art? You know, they entered an art gallery. Is that kind of a, a, an outpost of the natural history museum? But why does it look like a Gucci shop? Yeah. So 
the idea was to, to work exactly around this confusion. So this is a, a piece with no place because the whole idea is that it's out of place in any situation you put it. And it then traveled to the Cooper UI Design Museum as part of the design triennial. And, and then it was even more strange because it wasn't a standalone object. It was an, a, a collection of those fancy display cabinets within like a highly uh, you know, design show where the specimens was those strange um, organisms and this bioreactor that we had. So, so yeah, so we are trying to address it. And if you're interested, I can send Aggie um, references to some of the papers that you wrote exactly about um, this problem around um, those uh, social contracts and, and the current 21st century collapse of contracts. Yeah, so what it means where companies are doing way better art, art than any artist could ever do, selling peddling fantasies that can never be um, achieved and, and, and using strategies that are borrowed from the arts. And you know, this is actually a recent book was published claims that the 2013 tasting of the burger by Mark Post by this Dutch scientist was exactly influenced by him doing this event with me the year before. Yeah. So this is kind of a strange situation where science imitates art and, and you can actually track it and, and trace it. So so yeah, we, we live in a really, really interesting time where we, we see the collapse of our social contracts or the idealized contract, because obviously it doesn't operate like that exactly, but there are those idealized contracts that we have with both professions and institutions and that's falling apart. Um, we see a collapse of our relationship to the idea of life. We see a collapse of our understanding of what is living and non-living with those lifelike technologies. Um, so uh, one of the, uh, I suppose, one of our existential, uh, the existential angst that uh, allows for people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson to become leaders is exactly a, a cry for help from people realizing that kind of the world order is collapsing around them. And the way, the only way they can address it is by, you know, voting idiots in. But this is a, a symptom of the the crisis we're facing. Well, Oren, thank you so much. It's been so amazing to have you. We could hear you talk forever. Um, if you have any other references or papers that you might want to share with us, that would be amazing. But I've put the tissue art, um, culture art project website in the bottom there um, in the chat. So all of you, please check out um, uh, Oren and Ayanat's papers and the other work. And Oren, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful, wonderful chatting with you. And we'll post your talk online um, in the coming days. So thank you. Uh, thank you. And yeah, best of luck with your studies and everything. And yeah, hopefully I'll see some of you in person once Fortress Western Australia would open up. Yeah, yeah that would be amazing. Oh, Oren, thank you. Thanks everyone for listening as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.